to me, that's important. Uh, clinicians, certainly for thousands of years, we didn't have any technology. We, we didn't have any textbooks of medicine. All we just was heard, heard people and categorized them in different groups by something that we were hearing that allowed them to be categorized as having probably the same thing. And that's all that's happening. That's all this case definition is. Cognitive dysfunction, uh, as determined by sophisticated neuropsychometric testing, uh, is abnormal in 99% of cases, even though they do not even know it. When they're tested, they didn't find out that they, oh, you know, I couldn't do that very well. I didn't know that part of my brain wasn't functioning. Processing speed, short-term memory, especially auditory. Auditory memory is much more effective than visual memory. Uh, sensory and information overload. Going down a, a, an aisle, trying to select things for the, for the grocery store basket, that's, that's overwhelming. Just to make that selection from all those cans with all those labels, I just got to get out of here. Word searching, multitasking problems. Forget about multitasking. <laughs> if you can just just give me a little, give me a narrow focus and give it to me slow and I'll be all right. And spatial disorganization. Um, and I got <coughs> a good view of this from Carol as he tried to drive us here. <laughs> <laughs> Mood disturbances, 60% affected by sophisticated uh, psychometric testing. Only 60% of patients exhibit any significant psychiatric problem. 40% are unaffected by any psychological disease that they can measure by sensitive instruments. <coughs> of course, the 40% that have no psychological problems look very similar to the ones that do with regard to the drum roll. So if the drum roll, which really brings them together, doesn't seem to care whether you're depressed or not depressed, and the drum roll's not due to depression. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. you, you can't, if 40% if, if don't have any problems and look just like the same problems with respect to the drum roll as the others, then why can you hypothesize that it's just depression? What's furthermore interesting about this is the depression actually in these patients as a group, but not individually, of course, this group is rarely severe curious, curiosity of minds. Why, why do they slam these people with, as depressed when it's rare that this very severe? It can be severe, especially when their life comes apart sometimes. And, and unstable people that will probably be unstable no matter what they had. Uh, but it's not severe. Anxiety disorders are common. Mood liability is common. You'll be interesting to know that there's a subset of the psychiatric literature uh, that actually is finding that when you lower the cardiac output below a certain threshold range, guess what you get? You get this. You get that is what you get when you lower the cardiac output below a certain point. Fascinating. In other words, even of a psychological problem seen in this disease can be laid at the feet of output. And the microcirculatory consequences, either from the output itself or the compensatory mechanisms to protect the output, can have repercussions in the central nervous system. The dysfunction of this disease is intriguing. It's always intrigued me, and it's sort of like, um, <clears throat> why are you, why, why can't you work? Why can't you do things? And in the beginning of the illness, the primary things I get back is that, well, I can't work because I'm miserable. I've got these swollen glands and sore throat and fever and malaise and I'm aching all. I just, I just, I'm, I feel so bad. I can't work, and that's what we see in the beginning of the illness often. The concentration is on the symptoms. What is quite interesting about this is they're often still working. In other words, the people who are the most miserable are the ones working. Interesting. As the disease wears on and it takes its toll and other things tend to shift, it appears that later on there becomes more of a dynamic dysfunction. It goes something like this. You know, I used to feel really bad, and now I feel much better than I used to feel. But you know what? I can do less now than when I was really sick. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Almost something creeps into this of a dynamic dysfunction as opposed to certainly a, there's no fixed dysfunction. I mean, any CBIS patient can go up and pick 
up a pile of books and set it on the table. And of course, the people, these, uh, <coughs> these um, exams that you're given uh, that see if you can walk across the room and pick something up, you all do really well on because they don't understand this is not a fixed dysfunction, it's a dynamic one. They, didn't, they don't come back the next day and look at you lying in bed from having done that. There's a dynamic quality to this. If I push myself, I will pay for it later. And that's quite a different idea. And this dynamic character, by the way, is exceedingly common and is, the, in fact, the defining aspect of cardiomyopathy. Push crash phenomena is cardio. How do I know? Because I suffered from it. I know exactly what it's like. It has a dynamic quality. In the moment, you can be pretty good. But God help you if you try to push too hard. It's very interesting why pushing has such a devastating effect. So this dynamic quality is really of the epicenter of this problem. So if you have an issue, you know, I don't feel too bad, I'm not that sick and all, and I can do this, and I can do that. But if you notice a dynamic limitation on your, on, your, on your functionality, then you could well have this. It's not, I feel bad more than it is, I can't do anymore. And that dysfunction is captured by Phil Peterson at the University of Minnesota, and the dysfunction is so severe that the only known chronic disease that even close to that is cardiomyopathy. And guess what? They are one and the same. But the cardiomyopathy that most people are talking about is left ventricular dysfunction cardiomyopathy. You don't have that. You have an energetic problem and have a diastolic cardiomyopathy. Rather interesting, new. Not much is known about it. Little technology to really quantitate it. Little understanding of the compensatory mechanisms come to play when you even have this that hide it from you. Little understanding of how it could promote leaky gut. Little understanding of how it could promote psychopathology. Little understanding how it affects your skin and distorts your temperature regulation system. Nothing about that. And don't expect cardiologists to have a full range of view of this. They, they won't. But they will in time. Um, I talked the last time about the triggering, the, the, the phase of this disease. It seems to me, as I, as I go back to Tahoe days, it seems to me that things are changing. Uh, it, it seemed like in the beginning I just see, saw a lot of this phase one illness, which is the trigger phase. They seem to come down with a virus or some sort of infectious process. 70% of them did. 30% do not come down with a defining event. And we're, so there's an insidious onset in 30%, abrupt onset in 70%. I'm talking about the 70%. I'll give you the date this all began. It usually began with a chronic, some sort of viral. And then, then the aberrations of the viral, so they thought, well, I just got a virus, or the doctor said they did, and they had all the relevant requirements for that diagnosis, including low-grade fever and atypical lymphocytes and uh, swollen glands, sore throats, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Yet that diminishes over time, and it's replaced within usually months or so with what I call phase two, which is really quintessential CFIDS, and it's the drum roll. You know, I, I got that virus in October, and now today I'm, I have I no energy. I can hardly move around. I, I just I don't have any get up and go. Uh, I, I, my brain is peculiar. I can't, I can't remember seven digits long enough to punch it into a telephone anymore. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. And, you know, my muscles are starting to hurt. I, I never had this before. Now they're entering the triad phase, the chronic fatigue phase. And then after that, they enter this dynamic phase. And the distance between these can be literally years and sometimes months. The dynamic injury phase I used to ascribe to maybe some kind of injury to the hypothalamus. And I still think that is maybe relevant to this. But now I believe that the dynamic energy in injury phase is honestly a cardiovascular problem because it correlates so well. And there may well be other issues in the brain, but, um, but that's what I, I think that is. <clears throat> and the peculiar thing is that 
just as I, with cardiomyopathy more classically defined, never had any of, of these two things, therefore I never thought I had chronic fatigue syndrome, I did definitely have this, this push, increasingly this push-crash phenomena without a lot of the other things.